Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah. I'm the event coordinator at the bookstore, and I'm thrilled today to welcome Merve Emery for the release of her new edition of Virginia Woolf's masterpiece, The Annotated Mrs. Dalloway, uh, in conversation with Adam Dalva. While we're eagerly awaiting the, the return of in-person events, virtual ones like the one that you're about to see continue to be a joy for us. So I want to give a very special thank you to our guests for joining us this evening and to all of you at home for tuning in. Now for some housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please do click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We'll be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat button through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book, which is of course very important. Um, one caveat is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please bear with any technical issues that might arise and we'll try to resolve them as quickly as possible. We schedule a whole host of fall programming for you at Community Bookstore, so head over to our website, communitybookstore.net, and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I want to point out in particular is on Tuesday, September 21st, we're thrilled to welcome Ruth Ozeki for the Book of Form and Emptiness in conversation with Madeline Miller. That program's up on our website now and taking registrations. Finally, we've enabled Zoom's auto-transcribe setting for tonight, so if your version of Zoom is up to date, hit the live transcription button on your screen to enable closed captions. Now a little about tonight's guests, and we'll get started. Merve Amre is an associate professor of English at the University of Oxford and the author of several books, including The Personality Brokers. Adam Dalva's writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, The Paris Review, and The Guardian. His graphic novel, Olivia Twist, was published by Dark Horse in 2019. Adam serves on the board of the National Books Book Critics Circle and is a book critic for Guernica Magazine and Publishers Weekly. He teaches creative writing at Rutgers University and Marymount Manhattan College. Adam is a graduate of NYU's Fiction MFA program where he was a Veterans Writing Workshop Fellow. So without any further ado, I'll give a, hand it off to you, Adam and Merve. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Noah. Hi, Merve. Hi. So nice to have you. And so for everyone here, just a bit more housekeeping. One, Merve is uh, five hours ahead of East Coast. So it's about 10, I think, which is nice. Um, we're very happy you could join us. And two, as Noah said, there's a Q&A function in the bottom and we'll be getting to your questions in about 40 or so minutes. If any of them occur to you as we're having the event, just write them in and we'll be sure we get to all of them as we go. Uh, so today, Merve, we're talking about your, your gorgeous Mrs. Dalloway. Um, this book is so beautiful that I like pain me to read it. Um, you know, like every time fingerprints, smudges, I always felt really guilty. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. And I was wondering maybe if we could just start with a couple of kind of general questions. Uh, how did this project come to be? Adam, I am very afraid to say that you are cutting in and out and it is telling me that my internet connection is unstable. Okay. And so, so if we do, I'm just, I'm just doing this preemptively. If we do freeze, I'm going to call back in on my phone. Okay, but you sound terrific. You sound okay, terrific. Okay, good, good. And I'm just gonna repeat questions to you to make sure I'm not missing things as the, as the audio is skipping. How did this project come to be? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so Norton Liverwright has an amazing annotated series of texts and they were looking for someone to do Mrs. Dalloway. And I'm not a Wolf scholar. I teach Wolf to my undergraduates, but there was no real particular motivation for me to do it until when I was deciding whether or not to do it, I went to my parents' house and I was looking through a box of my old letters and other uh, uh, little trinkets, memorials that I have in their attic. And I found this letter that a friend of mine, a crush of mine, <laughs> sent me when we were around 10 or 11. And it became apparent from this letter that I had read Mrs. Dalloway and I had sent him my copy. And he had written me a, a fairly long letter about it in which he wanted badly to identify us with the characters, or I had wanted badly to identify us with the characters with Clarissa Dalloway and Peter Walsh. And he wrote me what is now a kind of hilarious letter insisting that we were not Peter Walsh and Clarissa Dalloway, but we were 
uh, Jake Barnes and Lady Brett Ashley from The Sun Also Rises. And for, <laughs> for those who remember that novel, they will remember that Jake Barnes and Lady Brett Ashley's romance is, is hopelessly thwarted by the fact that Jake Barnes is impotent after the war and that Lady Brett Ashley is uh, desperate to be ravished continually. <laughs> and so in, in either case, these were, you know, uh, misguided acts of identification, but it struck me that if the novel had been that important to me at that formative an age, then there was something very much worth returning to in it. I, I remember reading Mrs. Dalloway probably around the same age and, and rooting for Peter to get with Mrs. Dalloway at the end. Like I was really like, oh, I really hope he goes to this party and this works out for him. And of course <laughs> I've read it in my twenties. And then I read it again this, this week preparing for the event. And this time I was like, boy, Peter, what a what an odd character. And of course, Clarissa is not going to be reciprocal to that love. So I'm wondering like how you have this beautiful line in the introduction about how you sort of look at yourself writing that letter and kind of respecting the way you were reading back then. So I'm wondering like how, if you could talk a bit about how your reading of this book has shifted. Oh no, you were frozen, sorry. How has your reading of this book shifted? How is my reading? That's a, that's a great question. So, so I think it's shifted in several ways. I mean, first along the lines that you describe, which is, I think that there, that I come to it now with both sympathy and skepticism for many of the characters. Peter Walsh is a great example. And one of my favorite critics, Andrew Miller, describes him as gormless. And I like that word a lot. I think it, I think it works very well. So, so it's shifted in, in that sense, in the sense that I think as you get older, you simply see people in many more dimensions than you do when you are younger. And this is so much a novel about getting older, about feeling the passage of time, about trying to reconcile the self that you once were with the self that you are in the present and trying to understand how those different selves may or may not integrate with one another. And so I think it's a novel that just makes you deeply conscious of how time has passed in your own life. So that's one thing that I would say. The second thing that I would say is that it's very different reading this novel as an American in the UK. And to me, it was actually rather educational to annotate it because it made me realize how the past of this country and particularly its entanglement with imperialism and colonialism is, is everywhere still today. And one of my favorite parts to annotate is actually, was the description of the statues in London, many of which are still standing. And to realize that in this novel, as in the UK more generally, the empire is still in the details. Yeah. And, and I think that's particularly true too at a place like, at a place like Oxford. Yeah, yeah that makes complete sense. Um, I, I love that section on the statues and, the kind of context of like heroes who are also fighting unethical wars and the characters not really reacting to them in, in ways that, that we might expect. Um, but before we talk about some of those specific notes, um, your process of writing this as you reveal in the introduction was very interesting. You actually uh, typed out the whole book yourself. Um, and I'm also gonna type you the questions I'm writing you privately in the chat. Uh, so you typed out the whole book yourself and I was wondering what that was right, like. So that was about typing the whole book myself. Yeah. I'm so, yes, yeah, sorry. I'm so sorry. I do not know what is happening with the- I'm putting uh, the questions in the chat for you also, okay. just privately between us. So you can just always peek at those. Okay, thank you. Yes, I don't know what's what's going on with the, with the internet. You're very clear sometimes and then others you're completely frozen. Um, I hear that a lot. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's actually, it's a, it's a character flaw that's become an internet flaw. Um, you know, I, I, it's some, some people have suggested that the reason I typed the manuscript out myself was because I'm sort of a, a diehard fan or overly devoted to Wolf or because I wanted to inhabit her psyche or something like that. But, but the truth is that I think editing 
belongs to a long legacy of work that I would describe as, as philological, which is to say it's part of the discipline of creating, constructing, and authenticating uh, manuscripts. And when I think about how that used to be done, the way that it used to be done was through a handwritten transcription I, by actually copying out manuscripts and then annotating them alongside the act of copying them. And I wanted to be faithful, I think, to that as a technique. And I was interested in what it might teach me about a text. But one of the things I came to realize was that when you actually reproduce another person's writing, you start to inhabit their style almost physiologically. So you can feel when a comma or a semicolon or a string of three adjectives with an adverb hitch to the last one is coming. Style becomes embedded in your fingers or in your wrists. And there's some, I think, kind of extraordinary connection that happens between the hand, the eye, and the mind. Mm. And that to me was a very different way of reading than how I normally read. And it also, I think, taught me something about the scale of reading, because one of the questions when you annotate is always, what deserves an annotation? Is it a word? Is it a sentence? Is it a paragraph? Is it an entire interlude? We'll call them interludes, not chapters. Uh, is it a character, which is a construction that is dispersed throughout an entire novel? And so ultimately, I think the reason that I transcribed it is because it taught me a different way or multiple different ways of reading at different scales. When, when you were doing that, when you were there are over 400 notes to this book and i'm going to type this at the same time um, are there oh my god 400 okay. 430 i think or so um and i'm wondering before i ask you about some of your annotations is there any one note that most surprised you or startled you any bit of research that you were completely kind of blindsided by uh i don't know that there was anything i was blindsided by. I think one of the things that was surprising just going through her notebooks was that she is one of the most meticulous and deliberate theorists and planners that I have ever encountered. And to read her notebooks and to see her try out different forms for the novel to see her invent and then discard different characters, different plot lines, different ways of bringing things together was just extremely impressive. And when you couple that with her diaries, one of the things you see is that she is horribly anxious and self-doubting. She hates the novel at every turn. And she thinks about throwing it into the fire multiple times. And she's never happy with the end result. So even when she's reading the proofs, when she's waiting for the reviews to come out, she is she 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 simply is not happy with the end result. And even then, she's wondering how could I have made it better. Mm. And I I think there's something wonderfully demystifying about that because when we have a, when we read a classic or when we read something that has been canonized. Uh, before our lifetime, I think we come to it with a notion of, of perfection and infallibility. And I suppose that's the other thing you learn when you transcribe something is that sometimes you, you cut a clause or you switch some words around or you have another adjective than the one that she has and you think, you know what, my, it, it would have worked better. <laughs> there, there are ways it would have been better, which is, which is, I'm sure, completely blasphemous to say. But, but, but I, I, I do think that to me the most surprising thing was that this could have looked very different than than how it looks now. 
I love when you break into the list of animals that she uses. She has like the pet name and then there's like an al maybe an alternate list of animals, maybe a list of animals for another project, but just, you can just see a brain moving. Well, yes, I mean, and, and when you look at the manuscript, so what you're referring to is this wonderful list that she has in the third book of the hours books. Yes, that list yep. of animals. And she was actually working on a, on a children's book at, the time and this is this is one of the things that I actually think the internet or, or social media is really wonderful for because I, I came across the page in the manuscript and I had no idea what it was and so I took a picture and I put it on Twitter and immediately uh, a woman named Diana who's a graduate student at Columbia who probably is is a proper Wolfian was like that is the list of animals for this children's book that she was working Amazing. on for her nephews. And I believe Diana's credited in that. I believe she's thanked in that, in that footnote, right? Um, yep. And yes, yes, yes. And, uh, and so that's the other wonderful thing is you find pages for other books that she's working on. You find manuscript pages for her essays. You find her exercises in Greek because she was trying to brush up on her Greek you find sums in the margins of the manuscript for how much rent she and Leonard own, uh, how many copies of books their, their press has sold. And you see an entire life crowding into the, the manuscript. And that, that is also, I think, wonderful to try to take account of. This is unfortunately a very timely question that I'm gonna ask next. Um, sure. I've often thought of Mrs. Dalloway as a post-war book. And in your notes very immediately, it also became clear that it's a post-pandemic book, that Mrs. Yeah. Dalloway has had suffered from the influenza and her heart has, it's changed. I don't know if her heart is weakened as much as that it's changed. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the impact of, of the pandemic, which you hit a few times in your notes on, on this book and also on the character of Clarissa Dalloway. That's a, that's a great question. So I, I started annotating in, in March, 2020. And in some ways this was a great pandemic project because my children were home from school and I'm the kind of writer who, if I'm working on a book, really needs eight uninterrupted hours a day to write, which was not going to happen then. <laughs> but annotation is something that you can do in a, more interrupted way. And so it was, th th there's, a, there's a temporality of the pandemic that I think is registered by the very form of annotating. Mm -hmm. So that's one way that the pandemic was very much present. And the other is simply that it was impossible to access archives because they were all closed. And so all of the archival work had to be done by basically begging the amazing archivists and librarians at the New York Public Library, at the British Library, at Harvard's Houghton Library, at all of these places to just, to just make copies of documents that I couldn't get to see in person. Uh, so so that's, that's one way that the pandemic affected the production of the book or how I, how I think about an, an annotated book, in fact, as a pandemic book, in a sense. In terms of the substance of the novel itself, yes, it is absolutely an interwar book and a post-influenza epidemic of 1919-1920 book. And one of the things that I think you understand from our present point of view is why on earth anybody would be so excited to go walk down Bond Street to do some window shopping and buy some flowers. What on earth is, is, is causing that ecstatic outpouring of feeling and of language and all of those meditations on life, I love life, how I wanna hold it in my arms and crush it, life, right? And I think you can only understand that when you place it against the horrors of, of mass death that came with the war, but also with the the epidemic in Wolf's time, the pandemic, I'm sorry, the pandemic in Wolf's time, the pandemic in our time. And I think you can only understand it when you place it against the way that one's entire, li entire life changes when you are cloistered mm -hmm. within the four walls of your own home. 
that's that's uh, yeah i was really jarred in a good way when i was reading it so you mentioned bond street and before i'm gonna hold something else up to the camera um which are these gorgeous maps gorgeous gorgeous maps yes my husband um, my husband my husband made those which is awesome um yeah. and i'm wondering for me there was something very moving while i was reading your notes about specificity um reading about Dirtnell's van and then seeing a picture of Dirtnell's van and finding out what Dirtnell's van is, reading about walking down a street and seeing it very strongly mapped. I always I always think of, of Wolf as someone who exists in a sort of dreamy writing environment. So the very strong groundedness of this book, how almost everything in it is a reference to something extant and, and real was fascinating to me. And I was wondering, I was wondering why you think she grounded it so strongly in the city as the character, the very specific objects and places of the city. Yes, no, I, I think she is an immensely spatial writer, which is something that I really uh, only only realized, well, in, in part through helping Christian, my husband, make those maps, because what we had to do to do that was actually buy two fresh copies of Mrs. Dalloway, and we each read with a highlighter in our hand, highlighting every time there was a location mentioned wow. a street name, a shop name, a park, and every time there was a time marker. So whenever it says Big Ben struck the half hour, I, or anytime it said, you know, the clocks on Harley Street struck 1.30. And reading in that way is very alien to me. But I think that it's of a piece with how Wolf would read her surroundings. And I think of someone like Francesca Wade's wonderful book, Street Haunting, which is very much attuned to this aspect of Wolf. And I think that one of the things that makes the novel so intense and where the novel derives a great deal of its tension from is, is precisely what you point out, which is the intense specificity of geographic and historical detail run alongside those dream states run alongside the kind of porousness or the unrootedness of consciousness in the novel. And when you bring those two things together, it creates an amazing kind of aesthetic tension. Yeah, and, and, and on, that, on that idea of consciousness, you talk a lot at the, in the notes and in the introduction about the sort of what Wolf thinks of as her method for coming to know a character for understanding a character for for seeing them and I was wondering for maybe for those in the audience who haven't read this book yet if you could maybe go a little into what Wolf's method means when it comes to character because I was fascinated by that sure so I think what I will do is actually just read one of her her most famous diary entry when she Excellent. talks about character let me just make sure I can find it where are you <clears throat> Oh, so it's, it's her notebook entry from October 16th. I'll, I'll read two of them. The first is her notebook entry from October 16th. And maybe to orient it, one of the things I should tell the audience is that Clarissa Dalloway appears multiple times across Wolf's work. So yeah. she appears in, in Wolf's first novel, The Voyage Out, as a kind of purely silly satirical character. She appears in Mrs. Dalloway in Bond Street, and then she appears in Mrs. Dalloway. And she's clearly a character that gets into Wolf's head and stays there because she keeps coming back to her. And I think the other important thing to know is that her, in her first iteration, Clarissa Dalloway was largely based on Wolf's very good friend, Kitty Max, who was about a decade older than Wolf who was a sort of posh, party-throwing woman who was always talking about how much she loved life. And that Wolf's plans for the novel changed substantially after Kitty Max threw herself over the railings of her home and, and killed herself. I, and, and that happened just several days before Wolf writes this in her notebook. And she says, 
suppose it to be connected in this way. And by it, she means the different chapters or the different interludes of the novel. Suppose it to be connected in this way, sanity and insanity, Mrs. D seeing the truth, SS, that's Septimus Smith, seeing the insane truth. The book to have the intensity of a play only in narrative, some revision therefore needed. And I'm skipping a bit. The design is extremely complicated. The balance must be very finely considered. Character must be indicated. All to take place in one day, question mark. There must be excitement to draw one on, also humor. The question, and question is capitalized there, is whether the inside of the mind in both Mrs. Dalloway and SS can be made luminous. That is to say the stuff of the book, lights on it coming from external sources. And then later she describes her process as a tunneling process. And she says, I dig out beautiful caves behind my characters. I think that gives exactly what I want, humanity, humor, depth. The idea is that the caves shall connect and each comes to daylight at the present moment. And so I take two things away from that. The first is the reference to external sources. And if you've read Mrs. Dalloway, one of the things you probably remember is that there are two very famous scenes, one with a motor car and another with an airplane that are both circling around London. And that the motor car and the airplane become external sources that different characters look at and have thoughts about and then look back at. And the airplane then becomes, or the motor car becomes an opportunity to then shift to the consciousness of another character. So that's one way in which she means external sources. And the other way that she means it is that characters in this novel are constantly looking at one another. They're constantly looking at themselves in mirrors and then they're looking at each other and then looking at themselves back in mirrors. And so people become these external sources that reflect light onto others. So that's one thing. The second thing is that metaphor of the beautiful caves which I really, I really, really love that. But the idea that what it means to create a character is not to offer someone a, a string of sort of superficial details or surface level details. You know, so-and-so wore boots that were this color and their hair looked like this and they walked with a funny gait or whatever. But that what you would do is sort of dig out the mind dig out a person's mind and bring that to light and do it in a really kind of intense and concentrated and inexhaustible way. So that what you would ultimately show is that there is an infinitely expansive universe inside each person. And then even if your characters themselves are perfectly ordinary people, because many of the characters in this novel are ordinary people, they are not historic characters in a sense. It doesn't matter because they have a, a singularity, yeah. a, a teeming life of, of thought and feeling that lives within each of them. And a critic like Eric Arbach, for instance, found that to be a tremendously democratic way of going about creating character, to believe that anybody that you could see in this world would could lend themselves to that kind of sustained consideration is, is for him a very, a very a generous and equal way to think about who gets to be a character. I, I love that idea. Um, I was gonna ask you about mirrors and you, and, and you sort of hit it of, you have this wonderful line about Peter Walsh, which I'll just read. Um, he, is so, he is so excited for Clarissa to see him. And reading that section again, he is, She's gonna see me. I mean, he's so excited. Yeah, and yeah, he's yeah. In the, and he's in the book to see Clarissa. You yes. wrote, and I, I thought that was I, I totally changed how I read that scene. Um, and so this idea of characters being placed as mirrors or lenses, and then having later in the book something flipped on them, and they suddenly become the subject of someone else's glance. Peter intersects with Septimus in the park at one point. Everyone is sort of looking at one another without really recognizing. Right. And I think, you know, one of the one of the other things that I talk about in the introduction is, is going to Wolf's going to Monk's yeah. house, which is 
which was Leonard and Virginia Woolf's country estate in, in Sussex. And seeing that one of the objects that she had on her mantelpiece was a, a cloud glass, which is a painterly mirror. And it's not a mimetic mirror. It doesn't show things the way that they are, but it's a deeply estranging mirror. It's a funhouse mirror. And it shows you things that are far away too close and things that are too close upside down. And I think that that is also part of this novel's theory or philosophy of constructing character, which is that we do not see ourselves very clearly and we often do not see other people very clearly. And the sum total of those distortions is enough to, is enough for the drama of any novel. And of course, the greatest funhouse mirror for Mrs. Dalloway is Septimus, um, an unlikely doubling, um, but one that you say in the introduction that Septimus sort of emerging as a double for Mrs. Dalloway, as someone who's going through obviously a completely different day, but in some ways a parallel one, emerged to Wolf as she wrote, and that the character of Septimus as an echo of Dalloway increasingly became part of her process to the point, I think you're right, that she went back and sort of changed the beginning after. She did, she did. If you, if you read the original draft of the beginning, well, the, the first thing that you'll notice is that that famous opening line, Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself, used to be Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the gloves herself. And so I, I riff a little bit on that in the annotations, what's the difference between gloves and flowers? But then she also rewrote the second and the third paragraph. And for those who've read the novel, you will remember that in that third paragraph, Clarissa has a memory of being a teenager at her family's country estate and opening the windows and plunging into the air. And of course, it's supposed to be a foreshadowing of Septimus opening those great Bloomsbury windows and plunging into the air himself. But Wolf only writes that or, or introduces that in her revision of the novel. And in her, I think 1928 uh, afterward to the, to the, yes, in her afterward to the 1928 edition, she says quite explicitly that she was going to have Clarissa kill herself. And that ultimately she decided to have Septimus kill himself instead, but that the two are joined by a belief in the value of life, which might seem like an ironic or a paradoxical thing to say when you're talking about someone, a character who is committing suicide. But when you read his suicide scene, one of the things he's very insistent on is that life was good and he kills himself because he does not want to live as an institutionalized subject, he does not want to live the way the doctors want him to live. And this is something else that I was thinking about in reference to our present time. He does not want to reintegrate into a society where people simply pretend that mass death is normal and that it is not a crime. Mm -hmm. And he is very insistent on calling it a crime on calling the deaths of millions of people a crime. And I've been thinking about that a lot recently as we wait here for the term to start, the idea that everyone simply wants to go back to normal when in fact it feels like a terrible crime has been committed. Mm. Mm. And Septimus as maybe a repository for some of Wolf's own feelings on doctors, because Septimus has two doctors, neither of whom is of quality, I would I would say. One, one's better than the other, but they're both pretty bad. Um, and, and maybe her own mental illness, and your notes really touch on this, impacting her creation of, of the character. Yes, and, and her first suicide attempt involved her jumping out of a window. She writes in her journals about her hallucinations and there's a very beautiful passage about lying in bed and seeing the watery golden light on the walls. And if you read the very famous scene where Septimus is sitting in Regent's Park and 
the trees are brandishing at him and the light is dazzling every leaf with good pure humor. You see very much Wolf drawing on her own hallucinations. So there's that. There's also the fact that when she hallucinated, she used to hear birds chirping to her in Greek choruses. He also hears that in the park. And in her diaries, she says that the, the mad scenes make her squint. She can only write about 50 words a day because they try her so hard. And, you know, she, she's her, she, I think, I was just talking to somebody else about this actually, you know, the, the middle period novels. So Mrs. Dalloway to the lighthouse, Orlando, the waves. I think those are her best novels. And they're also the ones where it seems like she's kind of exorcising her autobiography yeah. as much as she can. And then, and then she doesn't return to that again. And, and, and with that thought in mind, one of my favorite bits of analysis you have in the book um, is on that very extraordinary sequence where Clarissa responds to Septimus's death. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite lines in the whole book is, he made her feel the beauty, made her feel the fun. And you said that that wasn't in the UK version originally, I think, and that that's sort of a contentious line among Wolf scholars. And I was wondering if you could talk, I was fascinated by that. Yeah, no, I mean, she cut it. And this is another sort of interesting thing to realize, right, is that we we basically think that once we have the mass production of books, we know what an authoritative edition of a novel is. So for instance, I'm just, what's on my desk right now? We think there's only like one version of, well, this is a bad example because it's a translation, but anyway, but we think there's only like one authoritative version. But one of the things you realize, and anyone who's a writer will realize this immediately, is that people change all sorts of things at all sorts of stages that don't always make it through to every edition. And Wolf had a different British and a different American publisher, and she leaves that line, he made her feel the beauty, made her feel the fun, in the American edition, and she cuts it from the British edition. And what's, what's in a line? Well, I think what's in this line, what's in this line is, is, is imagine the kind of person who would use somebody else's death to feel the fun of presumably their own life, maybe life generally as a concept, but, but also their own life at a party that they are throwing, which the entire British ruling class is basically <laughs> attending that night, right? Imagine the kind of person who would use the death of a sort of working class, aspirationally middle-class shell-shocked veteran in order to feel the fun of her own life. So I think to include that line is to include a kind of judgment of the character and the class that she's from. And it's a judgment that I think speaks to how people use others, how they exploit others, mm -hmm. the limits of the empathic imagination. But I think to leave it out is to leave things a little bit more ambiguous. And either way, it suggests that the novel lives two different lives and that the yeah. characters live two different lives. And I find that very, very interesting. Um, and one of the things I told you, Adam, before we opened the webinar up is that, you know, I, I in some ways feel like I'm a, I'm a con artist right now because this novel is like 96 years old and I'm like stunned that people want to talk about it. I, but, but every time I think of that line and I think about novels continuing to have lives and to live in different times, I think, well, you know, maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a justified con artist. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I can theorize my, my con artistry. I don't know. Well, as someone who was conned, I told you this beforehand, but I'll just repeat it to everyone because many of you have probably read Mrs. Dalloway. I've read Mrs. Dalloway, I think this is my fourth time. I hadn't read it in a few years and about 40 pages to go, the party was starting and I thought, oh, I hope the party goes well. I really <laughs> want it. You know, I really want her to succeed. Uh, and there's something magical about that, a book that bears rereading. And I yeah. think part of it goes back to what you were saying about character shifting, that my loyalties as a reader veered in, in this reading in some ways. And I found myself noticing different things uh, than, I, than I had before. And, and, and 
maybe as a segue, and uh, Noah's just asking, we have one question in the Q&A chat. Now I can take- One question. Away. No one else has any yeah. other questions. You so can throw ask, some questions. You can ask me anything. We can, a, we can AMA this, yeah. AMA. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but a question I have for you before, before we go to the, I'm sure now bustling Q&A section. No, is, it's uh, quiet. It's quiet. Not a party in there. Not a party in there. Can you tell that we've both been teaching on Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> Zoom teaching is a lot about, can you, can you comment? Yeah. Could you, yeah, yeah. Does anyone want to speak? Yeah. You can talk in the chat. That counts as participating. Uh, <laughs> um, the, you, you mentioned a bit ago that Mrs. Dalloway first appears in Voyage Out. Um, and you had a fabulous line about Voyage Out, which was that it's one of, I think, two heterosexual kisses in, in the wolf of, um, and yes. of course, of course I, as I was reading this, uh, the sexuality of the characters, the sexuality of Wolf, and her sort of dread of enduring heterosexual marriage in context of her marriage to Leonard, all of that was fascinating to read for me this time. And yeah. I was wondering if you could provide some context to our audience about that. Well, what I'm gonna do, I did this, so I, so I taught a class on Mrs. Dalloway at the 92nd yeah. Street Y, Amazing. and I read the, what is, known among wolf scholars as the as the orgasm scene in Mrs. Dalloway. And, yes. and it was funny because, you know, if you know the 92nd Street Y, you know that the sort of average age of the the student is like you know, 75. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I read this sort of out loud in, in a like slightly breathy voice. And it was this, you know, this this pattern of of uh <laughs> Of um, of rapt listeners, so I'm just going to read that scene that um, please, please. where where I think the queerness of the novel is most um, is most evident and is and is interesting. Okay, where is it? <clears throat> That's the famous kiss scene. So I need to find it. Ah, here it is. Um, <clears throat> so she's she's talking about how she failed Richard. So she failed him sexually, right? Clarissa is thinking about how she failed her husband Richard sexually. And she says, she could see what she lacked. It was not beauty. It was not mind. It was something central which permeated something warm which broke up surfaces and rippled the cold contact of man and woman or of women together. For that, she could dimly perceive. She resented it, had a scruple picked up heaven knows where, or as she felt sent by nature, who is invariably wise. Yet she could not resist sometimes yielding to the charm of a woman, not a girl, of a woman confessing, as to her they often did, some scrape, some folly. And whether it was pity or their beauty or that she was older or some accident, like a faint scent or a violin next door, so strange is the power of sounds at certain moments, she did undoubtedly then feel what men felt. Only for a moment, but it was enough. It was a sudden revelation, a tinge like a blush, which one tried to check. And then as it spread, one yielded to its expansion and rushed to the farthest verge and there quivered and felt the world come closer, swollen with some astonishing significance, some pressure of rapture, which split its thin skin and gushed and poured with an extraordinary alleviation over the cracks and sores. And I love, I mean, I, lo I love that passage for many reasons, but one of the things that I love about it is that it's it's exploring and remembering and owning Clarissa's queer desire. And at the same time, there's something so odd about that rupture pouring over the cracks and the sores. And at the same time that it's orgasmic, it's also pestilent. You think of pus. Right, you don't you don't think of coming. You think of pus, or you think of both of them together, which is weird. Or in a pump, <laughs> you know, yeah, um, and and so that to me gets at 
I think what's really interesting about the queerness of this novel and what's interesting about Wolf's queerness more generally is that on the one hand, there is that obvious desire and the willingness to dwell in the kind of sensuality of that desire. And on the other hand, the suggestion that that desire always comes aligned with some sort of sickness, some sort of wound, a kind of wounded sexuality. And if anybody knows anything about Wolf's biography, you probably know that she and Leonard had a almost entirely sexless marriage, that he talked about that quite contemptuously to his friends, and that the uh, most important sexual relationship that she probably had was with Vita Sackville, Sackville West. And so, so I think you see her working through or, or trying to understand mm -hmm. the structure of her own queer desire in that, in that passage in a very sort of beautiful and disturbing way. Yeah, sad in a and way. Sad. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, well, I don't know if it's sad. I mean, she, you know, there's nothing sad about those letters to Vita. <laughs> oh no, those, those are great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the pestilence is, is what I was thinking of. Yeah, no, doing. no, the, 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 yes, yes, no, certainly. So we, I'm gonna go to Q&A. Um, cool. We have four, it looks like we have four great questions already. I'm gonna read them in order and we can keep populating and keep chatting as we go. Question one, uh, parallels and comparisons with Joyce's Ulysses, if, if there are any, if Wolf was conscious of it. Yeah, oh, well, I mean, of course she was. She was wildly jealous of Joyce because the person whose approval I think mattered most to her was T.S. Eliot's. And he would you know, come over and talk to her about literature all the time. And he was a huge champion of Joyce's and he reviewed Ulysses. And when she writes about it, when she writes about Ulysses, she is very dismissive of Joyce and she's dismissive of him in highly classed ways. So she describes him as a kind of working class Irish man scratching at his pimples. <laughs> and you can see her snobbishness come out. And I think in that same entry, she even writes like, I only wanna write literature that touches the bluest blood only the bluest blood will do for me. And so there's a kind of dismissal of Joyce that is you know, both deeply problematic, xenophobic, classist, et cetera, et cetera, but I think is almost entirely motivated by her own jealousy of him. And then the formal parallels, of course, they both take place in a single day. Of course, they involve people walking around a city, but she says very interestingly in her diary for in her diary when she's talking about planning Mrs. Dalloway that she feels like Joyce gives you all internals and Elliot gives you all externals. And what she wants to do is find a way to bring those two into closer contact than she thinks either of them do. So she's very much thinking of herself as doing what she feels like both of them fail to do sufficiently, one in his prose, the other in his poetry. And then the kind of third modernist that you would want to, I think, put her into conversation with is Catherine Mansfield, whom she was very jealous of. She was very, <laughs> I mean, they were very good friends. And I think she loved her deeply. And Catherine Mansfield actually died while she was writing Mrs. Dalloway. And so her death along with Kitty Max's is another one that kind of haunts the novel. But her, um, you know, she, she always wrote most viciously about the people she was friendliest with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so her, right. <laughs> as, Nothing as new under does, the sun. <laughs> as one does, yes. There's something biting about Tom Elliott, you know, <laughs> like a snake, like an eel, like a slippery eel. Um, yes. So, so certainly, certainly in dialogue with, with Joyce, with Elliot, with Mansfield. Um, absolutely. Excellent. Um, I loved in, in the book, this is just more of a comment, how you often included what Wolf was reading at the time as she was writing sections of this book. I just thought that was, seeing her as a reader, and I know she's a great critic, but a reader while she's writing this was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's also just interesting what she takes from other yeah. people. I mean, a word that I keep using these days that, <laughs> that I take from her, which she takes from Austin, which I really like is the word unpretending. I, and and that's one that has like a very clear uh, clear lineage, but it is it is you know interesting to see her sort of 
magpieing her way around <laughs> around the reading. I love that. Uh, now we're just getting compliments, which aren't questions, but very flattering. That's so uh, nice. I'll take compliments. We, I will take them. Thank you. We will absolutely take compliments, but I'm going to go back to questions. We have an autobiographical question. You both, and I'm just going to say you, because we have 10 minutes to go. You read this at 10 years of age, six question marks. Please say more. <laughs> I mean, I was a very, um, it's a very lonely, nerdy kid. And I spent all of my time in the library when I was in elementary school because I didn't feel comfortable going out to play at recess. And so the librarians were kind of my best friends. And I, the, the boy that I write about in the introduction, the person that I read Mrs. Dalloway with, I, who is still one of my very close friends, he reminded me when I was explaining what I wanted to do in the introduction of this book, that not only had we read Wolf together, but we'd actually started out by reading Fitzgerald and that we had read The Great Gatsby and we'd read The Sight of Paradise and that I liked The Sight of Paradise more than The Great Gatsby. And this was actually a point of contention between us. And then we read Wolf, we read Hemingway. I think we might've read Salinger as well, which would make more sense probably. But I mean, I read a lot of things before I understood them. Yeah. And I think I, I think I liked that. I think I liked that feeling of, of ignorance and of misunderstanding. And I still like that. <laughs> I still like that. But yes, I mean, it, it can really only be explained by the fact that I had like very few friends <laughs> and that I spent a lot of my time in a library and that I probably felt more comfortable as I still do now being in the company of dead people and the traces that they've left behind, uh, which is, you know, probably why I'm an English professor. So. <laughs> Uh, that would have been basically my answer too, except for the moving yeah. childhood crush. So <laughs> yeah, right. I, I think uh, no one like that at the Browning School for Boys. Um, okay, next <laughs> question. <laughs> um, Merve, you speak so wisely about Wolf and Mrs. Dalloway. Thank you for this event and sharing your work. Has annotating this novel made you want to become a Wolf scholar or do more writing about your interpretation of Wolf's work? I hope so and ask us a past academic who published on Wolf as an elegist. Thank you, Karen Smith. Oh, thank you, Karen. That's really, that's really lovely. I mean, I think I'm going to, I would like, I mean, I shouldn't say anything because I haven't had a conversation with the press about it, but I'd really like to do, uh, I'd really like to annotate Orlando because that Ooh. one just seems like it would be deeply fun and, and yeah. visually would be thrilling. And I really want to, um, I really want to sort of pal around with Tilda Swinton. So for, for all of those reasons, I think I think I would like to come back to that. But you know, the the context in which I think I'll probably come back to Wolf first is that I've been sort of thinking about <clears throat> putting together a kind of essay collection uh, called um, Love and Other Useless Pursuits, because I've been writing a lot about love and friendship sex and desire recently and those essays all kind of coalesce around the same thing and part of the argument that I'm interested in making is that our primary frameworks for understanding love and desire are psychoanalytic and they have nothing mm. at all to say about beauty so Freud and civilization and his discontent says psychoanalysis has nothing to say about beauty. Like, isn't that weird that we theorize sexual attraction and desire and say everything about mommy and daddy and me, but have nothing at all to say about beauty. Wow. And I've, you know, I think that beauty, aesthetics, love, criticism, theory are all kind of useless pursuits. Yeah. And I would like to put together this essay collection in which beauty is introduced more firmly into accounts of love and friendship and desire. And I think Wolf comes in for me there. Mm. Uh, and I'm particularly fixated by this line in between the acts that repeats across several of Wolf's, or a version of it repeats across several of Wolf's novels, which is love and hate, how they tore her asunder. Okay. And that idea of being torn asunder is very, is very interesting to me and what it means to be torn, what it means to put yourself back together 
uh, what kinds of possibilities those open up for love and for beauty and for the making of art. That's that's an interesting question for me. So I think I think both an annotated Orlando, hopefully, and then also probably um, being torn asunder. Ooh, send me that. That sounds yeah. great. Um, the great scholar Wendy Moffat said, "This is wonderful. Thanks." So thank you, to Wendy. Wendy hello. Hi, Wendy. Wendy is Hi, also Wendy. my aunt. Wendy is my aunt, which is she's your product. aunt. Oh my goodness, that's so but nice. An amazing critic. Uh, now next is Aaron Rose with a great question. Um, I noticed that Peter Walsh refers to the sudden violent death of Clarissa's sister when a tree neglected by Clarissa's father, according to Peter, fell on her. Clarissa never refers to this. Did you discover in any of Wolf's notes that she deliberately didn't have Clarissa do that? Or do you think she might have forgotten? I think she might have forgotten. I mean, there, there are, I mean, and this is something that previous annotated editions are, I think, better at than, than my edition, and in particular, the edition that Anne Fernal does did for Cambridge actually. Um, tracks all of the discrepancies between the American and the British first edition, but then also tracks all of the places where there are sort of like errors in the text. So for instance, Elizabeth is referred to twice as wearing a red dress and then once she's referred to as wearing a pink dress, right? So those kinds of, those kinds of inconsistencies in just, um, you know, in, in detail. Um, and, and it seems to me like that's the sort of thing that Wolf would have one character mention and then sort of not think to, um, not think to come back to it again. But I mean, the, the other thing that it speaks to, right, is that I think it goes back to a point that we made earlier, Adam, which is that I think people see us very differently from the ways that we see ourselves and what might strike others as a formative or traumatic event in our lives mm. might not register that way for us, uh, either because it's not or because it has been buried quite deep or for a variety of other kinds of reasons. But that's one of the other things that I think this novel teaches us is that the, the narratives, the causal narratives in particular that we impose onto others are not ones that they would necessarily sign on to themselves. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Now the chat filled and we only have about three minutes. So if we don't get to all your questions, we're sorry. I'm just gonna take them in the order we hit them. Um, and this one I think is a big question, but an interesting one that we haven't gotten to. Did you uncover any interesting information about how the working class informed some of Wolf's choices in the novel? I'm thinking in particular about Lucy who seems so minor, but has one of the only moments from a servant in the novel where we see what she thinks and feels. Yes, well, and it's an interesting moment, right? Because she is thinking of Clarissa in these incredibly mythological terms. Her, her employer is a kind of uh, warrior goddess who has come from her walk and must be tended to. And there's an amazing, and there's actually a series of annotations about this, which is why I'm getting excited about it. Uh, there, there's, there's a series of annotations about how Lucy sort of goes on imagining Clarissa putting her into this mock epic for about two paragraphs. And Clarissa looks at Lucy and gives her like a sentence of thought and then simply walks away from her. And one of the things to, to register about this novel is the way that interiority gets distributed among the characters that belong mm. to different classes. And you see this especially in the beginning, at the beginning of the party, where everyone who is preparing the party, all of the servants who are preparing the party are pictured as kind of rushing around thinking about what the guests want but not having an opportunity to actually reflect on their own lives. Mm -hmm. And if you want to read a little bit more about Wolf's relationship to the working class, I highly, highly, highly recommend Alison Light's book, uh, Mrs. Wolf and the Servants. Great, uh, that sounds amazing. Um, do we have time right, for one more? I think we have time for one more very quick one. And I'm just kind of trying to find one that we can answer quickly. Okay, I'll just answer the first one and then we'll close. Um, I first discovered you, Mervé, through your analysis of Leonora Carrington, and I can't help but think about how both Wolf and Carrington had suffered at the hands of doctors. Are there any other comparisons you can make between the two? Well, my, my parents are doctors. No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because I just wrote, um, Leonora Carrington has this great unpublished and unperformed play called The Ba Lamb's Holiday which was adapted by the wonderful composer Olga Neuwirth into, Neuwirth into an opera called Balaam's Fest, 
uh, and it just had its second ever performance at the Ruhr Triennale Festival in Germany. And I, I wrote a piece for the program catalog. And uh, in, in between the acts, Wolf has a great line where she, uh, where the narrator is registering the sound of the sheep buying in the background uh, of this sort of pastoral setting. And she says something like, sheep have no souls. And then Leonora Carrington writes this entire play about how sheep do have souls and they are <laughs> dirty souls. And they're, they're these like filthy, oversexed rams. I, uh, and uh, they're doing all sorts of like nasty things to the flock. Um, and so it is, it is maybe a little bit unsatisfying to say that like, yes, doctors connect them, but they're also connected by sheep. And so I, no, I, I highly, good. yes, I highly, I, I highly recommend listening to uh, the Balam's Fest because it's a really great sort of electro techno opera. Um, and, and yes, I, I, will, I will say that sheep uh, is the connection. Love it. <laughs> wow, what a note to end on. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that. And thank you both for this really wonderful conversation. And to the audience, especially for your really excellent, engaging questions. Great questions. I wish we could yeah. get to them all, but it's getting very late in Oxford and we don't want to keep Merve up all night. Um, so again, thank you, Merve, Adam. This was fantastic. Thank you. And those of you at home, please consider purchasing a copy of the annotated Mrs. Dalloway. And we hope to see you at another virtual event very soon. Again, thank you for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank you for having me. Thank Bye, you. guys. Thank you. Take care.